Hello, I'm again Dr. James Wooten of IBM Quantum, and this is the second lecture on this course in quantum computation. In the first lecture, we looked at some of the basic prerequisites in terms of theory. So we looked at physics and we looked at computer science, at least at a very basic level. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at some basic prerequisites in terms of programming, because unlike the courses in quantum computing of many years past, which were purely theoretical. Now we can actually get hands on and do some quantum computing. And to do that, we have to use some programming. So we're going to go through some of the basic programming concepts that we'll need to use in this lecture. But we'll also be looking at how to use Qiskit. And the basics of using Qiskit means using quantum circuits. So this lecture will also be about thinking more about quantum circuits and how they're composed both from how you do it with Qiskit, but also the abstract concept of a quantum circuit that we will need to use in later lectures because the quantum circuit really is the heart of quantum computation. Okay, so let's get on with it. As with the rest of the course, this lecture follows sections in the Qiskit textbook. And we begin here with the Qiskit textbook, which you can find at this URL. We'll be starting by looking at the prerequisites page. There is a section on setting up your environment, which is lots of technical Pythonic stuff. We won't bother with that. Instead, we'll look at this section on Python and Jupyter Notebooks to give you some idea of the programming concepts that are needed in this course. So we're going to be looking at some of the basics of Python, because we're not really going to be getting into the depths of what Python is. You're not going to be a Python expert by the end, and you don't need to be, but you need to know how to do a for loop, for example, you need to know how to set up a conditional statement. These basic syntax topics of any programming language that you need to use them. So firstly, Jupyter Notebooks, what are they? Well, they're a way of having programs uh, that are laid out in a way that's quite nice for educational purposes or for making a presentation. You can have nice text, you can have graphs, but you can also have the actual program that does the programming. So these sections of the Qiskit textbook are actually Jupyter Notebooks. So here you have code, sorry, text cells, which are text. Then you have code cells, which have programming in. So let's click try on here because you can actually run the code cells within uh, the this, this web page of the Qiskit textbook. If we click run, you'll see it says waiting for kernel. I, I don't think you can see my cursor in this screen recording. Apologies if I forget that later on and use it as a pointer and you can't see what I'm pointing at. I'll try not to. Anyway, so it's waiting for the kernel, uh, which means it's setting up this environment where it's actually going to run things because not everyone who looks at these pages is actually going to run code, so it doesn't set it up automatically. But if you start trying to run them, it knows obviously you, you want to run them. Well, here's a pause I'm going to have to edit out. Come on. Well, anyway, I can talk about what we are going to do with the code cells once they get uh, set up. So um, here we have an example of setting up a variable and assigning it a value. You don't have to declare what the type is of the variable. You can just get on with it saying a equals 1, b equals half. So here we've got an integer. Here we've got a float. There's no difference in how we set these things up. There's no declaring of what these things are. It just does what it has to do. And we can do A plus B, which is mixing these different types of variable, and no one minds about that. If we were to run this, then what it would do is calculate A plus B and print the value. Uh, because there's no equal sign in this last line, then what the Jupyter Notebook does is print the result of that. So you would see a 2 here if the kernel was set up. And uh, you would see a 1.5 here if the kernel was set up. But of course, it is taking its sweet time. It's probably best if I actually allow these things to get into the final edit so you will know that if these things are happening when you try it, it's not because of any problem that you have done, but it's just some of the inherent problems of working with technology sometimes. Well, you probably know that. Uh, so as you may have seen, and I just about saw before I clicked the wrong thing, 
it did actually set up the kernel and give us a 2 here. And then we can get a 1.5 here as well. Awesome. It's doing things. Um, okay, so variables in Python can come in many forms. We've already seen integers and floats from before. We can also have booleans, so true and false. It's all lowercase except for the first letter, which is capital. That's just the syntax. You can also have strings, which are text, and you enclose them between two of these symbols or between two of these symbols or between three of these symbols, but that's probably a little bit too overcomplicated for this first introduction to strings, but you'll, you'll get used to them. Uh, you can have none types. They're useful sometimes. So let's set those all up in case we need them later. Uh, one very important thing though is the list. So here's the list, you use the square brackets and you put whatever you want in the list. Here's just a very boring list of some numbers. Uh, but here is a more interesting list showing that you can actually mix different types of variable. You can have integers, floats, booleans, none types, strings, all mixed together in a list. You can even have lists in lists. Okay, so one of the most important things when starting with a new language is to know if it's indexed from zero or not, and Python is indexed from zero. So if you want to have the first element of a list, you address that as element zero. So let's look at what element zero of the list is. And you see it's the first element of this list, 42. A similar data type to the list is the tuple, which when you declare it looks exactly the same, except that you use a different type of bracket. Uh, you address the element in the same way. But one difference between a list and a tuple is that you can change the elements of a tuple. So the element indexed five, so that's the sixth element of the list, we're going to change it to apple. Uh, so let's do that and then print the list and we find that our bananas have become an apple. But if we try this with a tuple, then you would find that it doesn't work. Now you can do things to get around this, but uh, uh, natively, tuples don't support item assignment, as you see. Also, for a list, you can append items. So we can say, I want to add a new item on the end, and I want that item to be this approximation of pi in this case. And now if we print that, so this is the syntax for printing, by the way. Uh, this is Python 3, so there's a little bit of a different syntax for printing in Python 2, but we're using Python 3, so it looks like this. Um, and now you see it's the same list as we had before, but now there is a pi at the end. Um, another useful data structure is the dictionary, which stores things in key value pairs. So you have keys, like for example, here's a integer serving as a key and associated values. And here is a string serving as associated value in that case, but you can use other things with keys and values. For example, here is a key that is a string. Here is a value that is an integer. Here is a key that is a Boolean. What a weird choice for a key. Here is a value that is a string. Here is a key that is a tuple. Here is a value that is a string. Uh, you can't use lists as keys, but you can use tuples. So that's one good thing about tuples to counteract some of their bad things. Okay, if you want to value, uh, access the values, you use the keys. So if you want to access the value associated with this particular key, then you will write a line like this. Uh, so let's run that and see what happens. And then we get the associated value. If we want to add a new value for a new key, you just write a line like this with the new value and the new key. If you try to access a new key, so if we don't run this and we remove that stuff, we're asking, what is the value associated with new key? And it says, what new key? But if we actually assign that, then it assigns that value to the new key. And now if we were to then ask again, and this is showing some of the weirdness of Jupyter Notebooks as well, where you can uh, edit the contents of code cells, but uh, it just runs the program 
in order with all of the commands that you're inputting uh, using the code cells, whether they're still actually written there or not. So this is one annoying factor of using Jupyter Notebook sometimes. Your bugs can be in code that you have already deleted. But uh, they're good for educational stuff. So anyway, there we see the new value associated with our new key that we have just added. OK, another important thing to know about any program link language is how to loop over stuff. And typically, you might just want to loop over a range of numbers. So if you wanted to loop over the five numbers, starting at 0 and ending at 4, you would say, something like for j in range 5. Here I'm using j as the name of the variable I'm looping over because I like using j as the name for the variable I loop over. You could call it whatever you want. So let's uh, do that loop and print out the uh, outcome. And there you see some numbers. Now you'll note that there is an indent here. This indent is actually important to the syntax of Python when you're in a loop or a conditional statement or other such things, anything that ends with a colon, then you have to have an indent, which could be some number of spaces or a tab. It's, uh, I think, best to be consistent by doing four spaces. Hopefully you'll be operating in an environment where if you press a tab key, it will do four spaces for you to keep everything nice and consistent. But yes, this is one of the fun features of Python. You can have bugs in your white space. OK, so in general, this goes up to n minus 1 if you have an n in here. So in this case, it went to 4 because we have a 5 in there. There's some more complicated things you can do with ranges, starting where you like and having any number of jumps between the values. But this is the basic syntax. You can also uh, loop over any object that is iterable, for example, a list. If we say for j in a list, print j, then it will output the elements of the list that we defined earlier. Uh, similarly, if we have a dictionary, then it will iterate over the keys of that dictionary, and then we can access the values in the normal way. And so here we're printing out the keys and the values. This empty print statement just prints a, a blank line so that we can have a bit of a space between these entries, make everything a bit clearer. For conditional st statements, we use if, elif, and else. So if is the if statement, elif is the else if statement, and else is the else statement. I'm going to assume some knowledge of programming here and not go into the, the rudimentary details of what this means. So here is the syntax for saying, for example, if strawberry in a list. So we're asking, is the uh, entry strawberry present in the list a list? If so, we will print a strawberry. Notice the ubiquitous white space here because we have to have the indent in these conditional statements. Uh, if strawberry is not in the list, then we will have the else if statement. Else if this particular element of the list is equal to an apple or equal to the string apple, then print we have an apple. So this is an example of how we test two things are equal in an if statement. Uh, else print not much fruit here. So let's do that. It turns out we have an apple. OK, so this is all doing the very basics of Python. Often we will want to do more complicated things, and for that we often have to install external packages. Uh, one package is NumPy, which a lot of people call NumPy, but I call it NumPy, so you're going to just have to deal with that if you don't like it. People can get quite opinionated on the best way to pronounce things sometimes. The NumPy package is important for doing maths, so if we want to do the sign of pi by 2, then NumPy knows what sign is and it knows what pi is. So we can ask to use the sign function of NumPy like this. We can ask to use the pi value stored in NumPy like that and get the sign of pi by 2. So we have to write this NumPy dot to show that we are asking to get these functions and values 
out of Numpy. But usually, to save a bit of space, people actually use this import statement, import MP as NP. So we can just use uh, np.find, np.py. And it gives us the same value. Also, we could just pull everything straight out of NumPy so we don't have to bother with any of that using an import statement such as this. And then we could just say, find pi by two. And this has its pros and cons. Um, for example, as one of the drawbacks, if you had multiple packages with functions or values that have the same name, then you'll, you'll get collisions and, you know, bad things will happen. So uh, if you want to do trigonometry, linear algebra and so on, then you have to use NumPy. If you want to plot graphs, then you'll use something called matplotlib. Then there's all other kinds of packages. I use graph theory um, methods a lot, so I use network X and so on and so forth. If you want to do quantum computing, then your best bet is, of course, Qiskit, and we'll talk more about that later. But there will always come a time when you have to write your own functions because you can't just take them out of some package somewhere. So here is the syntax for writing a function. This def is because you're defining a function. We are calling this function do some maths. Uh, we have two inputs, input one and input two. And then in the body of the function, which has to be indented with some white space, we have the actual stuff that your function does. In this case, it just assigns a variable, the answer to be the value of input one plus input two. And then at the end, you probably want to return whatever it is you're returning, in this case, the answer. So let's use this as follows. So we're gonna call the function do some maths. We are gonna put in a couple of inputs, the numbers one and 72, and we get an output. So we print that output and we find that 72 plus one, or indeed one plus 72, is 73 as a surprise to no one. Uh, one thing that should be mentioned is that if you give a function an object as its input and you call methods of the object during the body of the function, then that will change the object and you don't actually have to return the object. So that sounds very abstract. Let's look at it in practice. Here is a function called add sausages. We give it as uh, an input, a list. And so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna see if sausages is in that list. And if it's not, we are going to append sausages. So append is a, f a function that lives within the object that is a list. We are calling this method, as it's called, of the list to add a new value, which is sausages. So this actually does change the value, change the state of the list. And we don't have to return a new list that has sausages in it because we have changed the one that we supplied as an input. So let's see that in action. Uh, we can print the list before the function is applied. Then we can apply the function. Notice that we're not taking any output here. Uh, we're just calling the function. And then we can print the list after the function is applied. So let's do that. And what we find is that I didn't run the uh, func I didn't run the code cell that defines add sausages. So let's do that, and we won't get an error message next time. Or at least hopefully we won't. And there we go. We find the original list, which is as we saw before, and doesn't have any sausages in it. And then we have the final list, which does have sausages. I've said sausages far too many times for a lecture in quantum computing. Okay, now let's show you how to do randomness because that's also important. Import random, you can do things like uh, getting a random number from zero to one, so a random float in that range, which is pretty standard for generating random things in programming languages. But another fun thing is to call random.choice, which gives you a random Thing from an iterable. For example, if you give it a list as we've given it here, it will give you a random entry of that list. So here we see some samples. 
Here is a random number from random.random. Here is a random entry from our list from random.choice. And that is pretty much all you need to know about Python in order to do this course. Now let's move on to what you need to know about Qiskit. So we go down to the appendix, and in appendix, we go to the section on Qiskit, and we're going to look at some basic Qiskit syntax, both from a programming perspective, how do you use Qiskit, but also from the perspective of understanding better this notion of a quantum circuit and how it works. So there are detailed installation instructions for you in for you to install Qiskit, but let's uh, not bother with those. Let's assume that you have an environment where it works and move on with how to use it. So as I've said, the basic object at the heart of quantum computing is the circuit, this thing that contains our qubits and their life story and this final moment of measurement where we extract an output from them. We create these circuits and we get outputs from them and that is what quantum computing is all about. So in Qiskit, we say from Qiskit import quantum circuit. So this is another form of a import function. Instead of just saying import Qiskit and then we get everything from Qiskit, we can specifically say from Qiskit, I want this thing called quantum circuit. And then we can uh, use that from then on. So then we can say, for example, we want QC, to be an example of a quantum circuit. And so this is how we set up a quantum circuit object. This is currently an empty circuit with no qubits, no inputs, no outputs. Uh, this is not often how we set up quantum circuits, but we are in this introduction taking it from nothingness and then building up. I'll show you the simpler and more commonly used syntax a bit later. Okay, if we want to make our circuit less trivial, we need to define some qubits. So we do that in the form of what we call a register. A register is a collection of qubits. So we get the quantum register object from Qiskit, and here we're setting up a quantum register. That register has two qubits, and we can optionally give it a name. Here I'm giving it a name, it's called A. Let's run that. So we actually set up our quantum register object QR. And then we can add that register to our quantum circuit by using the add register method as follows. And if we want to see what quantum registers are contained within our circuit, we can call this QRegs attribute, which just tells us a list of the quantum registers in our circuit. So we find that I did not run the cell that set up the quantum circuit. Now we go back here, we run it, and we find that we have in our circuit a single quantum register, it has two qubits, and it is called A, which is not a surprise to us because that's the one we just put there. Okay, now our circuit has some qubits, we can see what it looks like. We can use this method qc.draw, which is a function contained within the quantum circuit object and it will draw it. See, we have two qubits. They are called A0 and A1, and they are doing absolutely nothing because we've not put any gates in this circuit yet. Okay, so let's apply some gates. There is, well, one way to see what is contained within uh, an object in Python is to use this dear function, and we can see all of the attributes that are associated with it, all of the methods. And you can see things like a CX method, which uh, you already know the CX gate, so uh, you should know something or suspect something about how that can be used. We also have we also have H. We also have down at the end of the alphabet. You'll find that we have X. So these gates that we've already seen in the last lecture, you will be able to see sitting within this quantum circuit object. So let's use one of them and see what happens. What we find is that we actually have to supply some inputs because this is a function that requires inputs and it is nicely telling us what input to give. It is missing one required positional argument, which is qubit. So if we want to apply a gate, of course, we have to tell it what qubit 
to act on. So I'm having this here as an error message because error messages can actually be quite illuminating sometimes to tell you what's going on in a circuit. Um, so let's apply our gate H to the qubit, which is uh, qubit zero of our quantum register. So as with lists, uh, qubits in quantum registers are indexed from zero. So if you have a five qubit register, for example, your qubits will be called zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, because there's no equal statement in this, um, the Jupyter notebook thinks it has to print something out. So what it says is, well, I can see a quantum circuit object having a gate applied to it here. And so it prints out some weird thing. You can just ignore that. OK, we can also add a controlled knot using CX. For that, we have to use a control and a target. The convention is that the control goes first and the target goes second. So this uh, qubit that we have previously applied a Hadamard to, we are now using as the control of our controlled knot. And the qubit that we applied nothing to so far is getting the target of this controlled knot. Now our circuit has a bit more to show. There we go, our Hadamard and our controlled knot. OK, so now we're at the point where we actually have a circuit that is worth running. So let's look at how to run it. There's different ways to run quantum circuits in Qiskit. You can use real quantum devices and you can use simulators. And in simulators, you have different choices for the kind of output you want to get. First, let's look at the state vector simulator. In future lectures, we will see that there is a way of representing what's going on in a quantum state using vectors and matrices. So if you want to see the vector that corresponds, to the state of these qubits after we've applied these gates, then you can get that using the state vector simulator. So we do that by saying from Qiskit import air. So air is the thing that uh, contains our simulators. And then we say from air, we need to get a backend. Uh, backends are the term that we use uh, to describe the things on which we run quantum circuits. And specifically, the back end we're going to use is the one called State Vector Simulator. So let's set that back end up and call it SVSIM. OK. Also, if you want to see a list of all of the possible back ends you can find in air, then this is what they look like. You've got the Chasm Simulator, which emulates a real quantum computer. The kind of outputs you get from that are the kind of outputs you can get from a real quantum computer. The state vector simulator gives you a state vector. This is not something you can ask for from a real quantum computer. It's giving us the mathematical representation rather than what we actually get out of a quantum computer. A unitary simulator, similarly, but that takes a, a view from representing it as a matrix rather than as a vector. And the pulse simulator is below the level of gates. It's the physics that is used to actually create the gates. And that's not a level that we're really going to be looking at and in this course, where we're going to be looking more at the gate level. So we're not going to be using that at all. Now, all these simulators are local, which means that they run wherever the Python runs. So when you're running through a Jupyter notebook and you do something like one plus one, whatever computer is calculating that one plus one that's where your simulation is going to run. So if you are running it on your own machine, if you've installed Jupyter Notebooks on your own machine, which, by the way, is the best way to run them, then these simulations will run on your own machine and um, not on the cloud, not on a real quantum computer. OK, so running the simulation is done with a two-step process. First, we have to assemble it into a POPJ, and then we have to run it. So uh, we turn the QC into a quabj, which in this case isn't really doing much. It's just another type of object which the run command expects to get. So we have to do that. And then we uh, take our back end and apply the run object, uh, run method of that back end on this quabj. And that will give us a job object. Now we get to a point where you can either Think about all of these steps and understand really what's going on. Or you can think, I don't care. Give me some big, long line of code that I can copy and paste um, so it works. 
But if you want to know, uh, once you've got a job object that has a method dot result, which can be used to generate what's called a result object. And once you've got the result object, you can ask it for the actual result. In this case, the result object can give you the state vector. Now, when you're running on real devices, it becomes a bit more uh, important to know the difference between these things. Because, for example, once you start calling um, these methods of the result object to get an actual result, if the job hasn't run on a real quantum computer yet, if you're still in the queue, if it's still running, then it will just hang there until it gets a result and then give that to you. So, so in order to manage what you're doing within a program, you should know what these things are doing. At this level, we don't really have to bother. And you can instead think, well, I've just got to use this big long line with all the weird things in. So here, this is the big long line with all the weird things in that we use to get the state vector. And I'm going to call that state vector ket for reasons that will become clearer throughout this course. And uh, this, if we iterate through all the amplitudes in the ket and look what it looks like, it looks like this. At this point, you probably don't know whether that's correct or not, but I can tell you it is. One little aside here is that these are in general complex numbers, and this is how complex numbers, or at least this is how the imaginary part of a complex number is represented in Python with this j. So that's what that's doing. OK, now, now we have this state vector. We can show another thing, which is the possibility to initialize a circuit with a state vector. So if you don't want your state vector, sorry, if you don't want your circuit to start off in the all zero state, as it usually does, but as something else, then you can take a state vector that you've prepared earlier. You can take a quantum register that is part of your circuit that is on the right number of qubits for this particular state vector. And you can call initialize to initialize that circuit with that state vector. There you go, it works. Uh, now, if you were to call new QC dot uh, draw, for some reason, I always think it's show and not draw. I have no idea why, but every time I ever choose draw, I have to think it's not show, it's draw. Anyway, here's what this initialization looks like in the context of a quantum circuit. If you were to run this on a real device, it would have to work out actually what gates to apply in order to do this initialization. And at that point, you might find that you probably know better how to initialize this state vector than Kiskit does, and you should maybe try doing it um, manually. But it depends on what you're doing. But that's just a little aside. OK, so that was a state vector simulator. Now we're going to go for a chasm simulator. So we're going to do things the way they are done on a real quantum device. And that means we need the act of measurement in order to give us an actual output. So for this, we need to insert some classical registers, which are the bits onto which the output is written. So we import classical register. We set up a classical register, in this case, a register of two bits. And we add that register in exactly the same way as we added the quantum register. And now we can do measure commands. You'll see measure commands have two inputs which are the qubit that is getting measured and the bit that the result is being written to. So let's do these two measurements. We're measuring qubit one and writing it to bit one, qubit two and writing it to bit two. Now we're drawing and we see now we have these measurement commands. So there we go, that's our circuit. That's a circuit that can be run on a real device or in this case using air a chasm simulator. So again, we need to assemble it. And in the case of something running on the chasm simulator, there's a little bit more going on in the quadge, which is uh, the number of shots. So there is some randomness in many circuits. And to get statistics on that randomness, we will want to repeat many times uh, the process. So you have to choose how many times you want to repeat it. That is the number of shots. By default, so if you include no shots uh, input here, it will be 1024. However, I want to do as many shots as I can. So I'm going to put 8192, which is often the most shots we can ask for in a single run. 
Okay, so that's the number of shots that we're using. Uh, let us now run this quadge. And we've now got a job object, so nothing seems to have happened because it's just given us that job object. But uh, if we want to see the result, we have to do something with it, which is the classic weird bunch of things. We do the dot result to get the result object. And now we're doing get counts to get what's called a counts object. So let's uh, print that. And we see that it's a dictionary with um, the keys being bit strings. These are bit strings describing the output of our quantum circuit and also the number of samples which resulted in that particular bit string. Here we see that they are equally split between 4096. Uh, this is because uh, this particular circuit is equally likely to give us either 00, zero or zero 01. And so uh, the most likely result is for them both to give 4096. But usually we would expect to see some statistical variation here. So the fact that they're actually both the same, it's kind of a rare event. If we were to run it again, we would see a bit of variation, as you can see there. Okay, so it's basically a histogram, but in dictionary form. Uh, if we want it in a actual histogram form, then we can get Qiskit to do that for us. Uh, if we have compatible backends, we can also get the ordered list of results. Uh, to have the ordered list of results takes up a lot more memory, so it is not given by default, so we have to ask for it when we do the running by having this memory equals true thing. And we can get it by going uh, get memory. And so we do that, and this is the ordered list of results. Here I've only done 10 shots rather than thousands because it's going to print at the end. Okay, now one thing to notice is that bits are labeled from left to right. So when we're talking about CR0, the first bit of our classical register, this is the bit to the furthest right. So let's have an example. So for this, we really need more than two qubits to make things a bit clearer. So we're going to have a quantum register with eight qubits, classical register with eight bits. We're going to set that up in a quantum circuit. Here we don't use the add register. We just supply them when we're initializing. That's another way to do it. And we're going to apply an x to qubit seven. And then we are going to measure all of the qubits. So we're going to measure qubit zero and write it to bit zero, qubit one to bit one, and so on and so forth. The simplest way to do this is just to say measure this whole register to that whole register. And then we assemble, we ask for a number of shots, and we run and get the counts. And you'll see that this is a result. So by default, if we were to have no gates in this circuit, we would get the outcome, which is all of them zero. So the act of this X gate is to flip qubit seven and therefore bit seven to a one. And we see that bit seven is here on the end because this is bit zero, bit one, bit two, and so on and so forth, up to bit seven. And the reason for this is that if you were to see this representing a number in binary, this number would be representing 2 to the 7. So the, um, the index of the classical uh, bit represents the power that it would correspond to when representing numbers in binary. Uh, another important thing is simplified notation for doing circuits. If you were to say um, create a circuit using this statement, what you're asking for is a quantum circuit with three qubits in. So it's already automatically giving you a quantum register. You don't have to set up that quantum register yourself. And if you were want to want to do gates on this, so this is the three qubit circuit. If you want to do a gate on the middle qubit, which is the one indexed as one, then you just put a one in there. So there you go. Um, now, if you wanted to define a circuit with both classical and quantum registers, then you just define two arguments. So here's one with two qubits and only one output bit. So if we were to do a Hadamard on qubit zero, we were to do a controlled not controlled on qubit zero, targeted on qubit one, and then we could measure qubit one and output that to the bit, the single bit, which is bit zero. 
and then draw that. And that's what it looks like. And it's kind of a boring circuit, so we're not going to run it. Uh, also, we can create custom gates. We do that by creating a circuit which has our custom gate. And uh, so, for example, here's a particular circuit, which is a bunch of controlled knots. There's actually a very sensible reason why you might want to do this particular bunch of controlled knots, but we'll do that in a later lecture. Uh, we can use this uh, to instruction method to turn this into a gate. Uh, and then we can use that gate whenever we want in a circuit. So if we were to have a four qubit circuit and we wanted to apply this three qubit gate, now we can do that by using this append method and putting in the gate we want and then specifying the, the particular three qubits we want to apply it to. And that's how we uh, represent that in circuits. Right, if you want to access real quantum hardware, then this requires you to sign in with an IBM quantum account. Uh, this is not a requirement of the course for you to create one of these accounts, but it might be useful for you to do so. And also cool for you to do so because you can use real quantum computers. So for that, you will now need to start running these things within the IBM quantum experience or on your own machine because it requires a sign in and this web page is anonymous and therefore doesn't have any sign in. So you can click here to go to the IBM quantum experience and it will set up everything that is required for you to run this particular notebook there. But rather than look at that, uh, we can just look at the syntax. So to get the backends particular to uh, signing into the IBM Quantum Experience, you need to import IBM Q, and then you need to do this thing called load account, which is very easy to do in the Quantum Experience. Uh, if you want to do it on your own computer, you have to do some fiddling about with setting up your account first. Uh, then you set up a provider, and this is the provider line that you should use. And then you can get backends from that provider in the same way that we did with Air. And these backends will mostly be real quantum computers, prototype quantum computers that you can use. Uh, but one of them is also a chasm simulator. But that's one that runs on the cloud and therefore can be on a supercomputer and do fancier things. Uh, so for this, you need to look at sort of the status of backends. Are they actually running or not? And all kinds of complicated stuff like that. Uh, this is not a tutorial on. Kiskit, this is a lecture in a quantum computing course, so I'm not going to go too much into detail about that because we've basically got to the end of uh, the, the real content here, which is talking about quantum circuits. But this is all cool stuff for you to look into. OK, now on to the next part of this lecture, which is a, an introduction to quantum gates to prepare us for looking into quantum states and gates next week in the context of actual linear algebra. The next week we'll be looking at the mathematics that we use to represent quantum states and gates. But this week we are going to try and get some intuition into these things first before we look into the mathematics. And for that we can use a visualization. And that visualization lives in the Hello Kiskit game here. OK, so this is a Jupyter Notebook, and we can run these code cells just as before. So this first one is just an example to get things up and running and show that things are actually working. So let's click Try. And uh, when it's eventually finished setting up what it needs to set up, it will print the statement, Hello, I am a code cell. Uh, of course, it's got to do the kernel again. Now, anyway, let's move on from that. And the next thing that has to be done afterwards is to import everything that we need to import in order to run this visualization. So there is some tools within the Kiskit textbook that it's going to import that from. So you just have to run that, and it will tell you when it's sorted it. It's sorted it. So let's move on. So basically, here we have a series of puzzles that are going to get us into the right frame of mind for quantum computing. And uh, I'm going to do the first couple of levels to introduce the visualization. And then it's your exercise to continue on and do the exercise at the end. The exercise at the end is actually to set up a test of Bell's inequality. 
which is pretty awesome. It's a proof that variables of quantum computing are fundamentally different to the variables of normal computing and can do things that variables of normal computing cannot do. Of course, this was not how it was first phrased back in the 1930s by Einstein and some of his colleagues, but it's the way it's phrased in this context. Okay, so here's the puzzle. We just have to click Run. This is a visualization we're given. In this case, we are visualizing a single bit, and then we're going to um, increase our visualization to the point where it can deal with two quantum bits. So here, our single bit is going to be represented by a circle, which is black for zero and white for one. And the point of this particular puzzle is to apply the not gate three times and watch how the not gate turns the bit on and off. Not much of a puzzle, just getting us into how to use this particular visualization. Now we see two bits. We have the one on the left that we saw before, and we have one on the right, which is represented in exactly the same way as a circle, but now it's on the right. And our job in this case is to apply a knot to the bit on the right instead and see that one flip. Okay, so far, so easy. Now let's run the next puzzle. Uh, so the exercise here is to use a controlled knot to turn on the bit on the right. So to make the bit on the right go to its one state rather than its zero state. And when we are asked to choose a bit, what we are choosing is the target bit. So the controlled knot, of course, has two um, qubits or bits that it acts on, the control and the target. But in this visualization, there are only two. So it's obvious which two it's acting on. All we need to tell it is which is a control and which is a target. So the convention is that we choose the one that is the target. So we need to turn this from its zero state to its one state. Um, so when I say this, I mean the bit on the right, which is currently a black circle. I have to remind myself that you can't see my pointer. Uh, if we had a knot, we could just apply the knot, but the only gate that we are given is a controlled knot. So if we can do a controlled knot, which is controlled on the bit on the left and targeted on the bit on the right, then it will apply a knot to the bit on the right if the bit on the left is in its one state and it is in its one state in this case. So that's going to work. So let's apply that. And there we go. Okay, puzzle. Four. Any program we run is made up of many gates. So let's do the basic step towards this, which is just apply a couple of control knots to do something a little bit more complicated than we did before. So we need to turn the left bit off and the right bit on. So here we're in a case where the bit on the left is in its on state, the bit on the right is in its off state, and we need to get the opposite of that. That is the target for this particular puzzle. If we had a couple of knots, we could just apply a knot to both, but we only have controlled knots. So we can use a controlled knot. If we control it on the bit on the right and target it on the bit on the left, well, actually, let's do that. We're going to control it on the bit on the right, target it on the bit on the left, and nothing happens. And the reason is a controlled knot. We can tell this story that it looks to see what the bit on the right is doing. If it's in a zero state, it does nothing. If it's in a one state, it flips the bit on the left. Uh, and because the bit on the right is in its zero state, then nothing happens. Uh, also, we can think of it as computing an XOR of the two inputs and replacing the target bit with the result of that XOR. In this case, one is zero, the other is one, so the exclusive OR is one. It's going to replace the state of the target with one. The state of the target is already one, so nothing happens. Let's instead replace the bit on the right with that result of the XOR to make it one instead. So controlled on the bit on the left, targeted on the bit on the right, 
we apply that operation. Now that one is one. But now if we do a controlled not controlled on the bit on the right and targeted on the bit on the left, it will actually do something and turn that one off. And that is the solution of the puzzle. OK. Now we're going to fill in some of the empty space that is present around the puzzle board. Uh, for that, we're going to start thinking about what happens and how to visualize what happens when things are random. So here, the bit on the left is gray. It's not black or white. And that is representing the fact that this is just a random value. Uh, we don't know what it is. It's random. It's 50% 0, 50% 1. But when we apply gates, how can we think about how that randomness is going to be manipulated by the gates that we apply? So let's, for example, do a controlled knot, controlled on the bit on the left, targeted on the bit on the right. So what's this going to do? Well, the result of the XOR is random because one of the bits involved is random. So it's going to replace the bit on the right with a random value. So let's control it on the bit on the left, the random one, target it on the bit on the right, and we get that both of them are now random. However, they're not completely random because they will always be the same value. There's a correlation here. They're not independently random. The one on the left is a random value. The one on the right is the XOR of that random value with zero, and therefore the same random value. So either the same value, but they're random. So if we look at either of them independently, we will see something random. But if we look at both of them, we will see that they are both either randomly zero or randomly one. OK, let's move on from that. In fact, we're going to see the same effect as we saw when we ran that circuit in Qiskit earlier. Now, in the next puzzle, we're going to see a new circle, which is going to represent a bit of information that we lost before. So before, we have this example of two random values, but they're not independently random, they're correlated. But if we were to represent two bits that were independently random, we would draw the same picture. So obviously this visualization is missing something. It's missing the ability for us to convey information about correlations, anti-correlations, anti or a lack of correlation. So let us add that information in. And we add that information in by placing another circle floating above the other two, like an angel. And that is going to represent the XOR, the exclusive OR of those two values. So if they are the same, it is black. If they are different, it is white. And if their similarities or lack thereof are random, it will be gray. So in this case, this XOR value is gray because the XOR is random. Uh, so it's important to point out this new circle does not represent a third bit. It represents the XOR of our uh, existing bits. OK, so now let's uh, do some things. And in fact, let's do the thing that we're supposed to do. We're, make, we're supposed to make it certain that these two bits disagree. So we're supposed to make it so that there will definitely be an exclusive OR of 1 for these two bits. So for that, we have to deal with this randomness. Well, if we apply a controlled not controlled on the bit on the left, targeted on the bit on the right, we get to this state where they are both random, but they're both the same. And because they're the same, their exclusive OR is 0. They're always the same. Their exclusive OR is 0. We need them to be different. So all we have to do is flip one of them, and they'll be certain to be different. Their exclusive OR will be 1. And that's what we needed. OK, so now we have got to the end of our quest to represent bits using this visualization. Let's do one last puzzle for fun, which is to turn the bit on the right. Turn on bit the bit on the right. There's obviously a typo there. That should be fixed. Well, we need to turn on the bit on the right to make it go into its one state. Currently, it's random. So we have to do something about that randomness, where if we do a controlled not controlled on the bit on the right, targeted on the bit on the left, at least that randomness is also shared by the other one. Uh, now the exclusive OR is zero. So if we want to make the bit on the right certain, we can do a controlled not controlled on the bit on the left, targeted on the bit on the right, and we'll replace the bit on the right 
with this exclusive or, which is the certain value of zero. So let's do that. And uh, it's certain to be zero. Now we just apply a not to make it certain to be one, which is what this puzzle wants us to do. Okay, now level two is to start thinking about how to represent quantum states. So the states of qubits rather than just bits. And for that, we'll be filling in some more of the blank space in this visualization. Okay, the first puzzle is basically just the quantum version of the first puzzle from the first level. So we have not a not gate now, but an X gate, and we have to do it three times on the visualization of a single qubit. So here is our qubit. Note it is represented by two circles on the same side rather than just one. So a qubit is represented by two circles. We'll see why later. So now let's just see what an X does. It flips that uh, one value to a zero, the zero values to a one, just like the not gate did before. Although it's acting on that particular circle and not the other weird one that we have extra now. Okay. In puzzle two, we are to understand more about why there are two circles and it's not because there are two separate bits but it's because for a quantum bit there are multiple ways to extract an output from the same qubit with a bit that's not true a bit is either zero or one it's always just zero or one it doesn't matter if we're looking at it or not it is just zero or one that's it for a qubit we have this act of measurement which forces it to decide whether it's zero or one. And there are different ways that we can do the measurement, which means that it will do a different process in making that decision and therefore might give us a different result. These two circles represent the outputs for two particular ways of doing the measurement. The one that is at the bottom represents what we call a Z measurement, that is the normal measurement. If someone just says measurement without qualifying what kind of measurement, they typically mean the Z measurement. When we use the measure gate in Qiskit, we are doing a Z measurement. The other one represents the X measurement, which is everyone's second favorite kind of quantum measurement. So here, what we are seeing is that this qubit is in a state where if you were to do a Z measurement, you would definitely get the outcome one. If you were to do an X measurement, you would get a random outcome. Okay, so what do we have to do in this particular puzzle? We have to turn off the Z output. That's the way that we are, that's the terminology that we're using in these puzzles. The output for a Z measurement, we're calling it Z output, so we don't have to write the output for a Z measurement all the time. So we want to make it so that um, the output for a Z measurement would be zero rather than one, which is what it is here. And it is the X gate that does that. So let's do it. Okay. So in the next puzzle, we are going to be introduced to a second qubit. So it sits over on the other side, as you might expect. There's two circles, one uh, at the bottom, one at the top. The one at the bottom represents the outcome of a Z measurement for this qubit. The one at the top represents the outcome of an X measurement for this qubit. What we are supposed to do in this puzzle is to do exactly the same as before, but for the other qubit. So we apply the X gate on the other qubit. There we go. Um, from now on, we will stop calling them the qubit on the left and the qubit on the right, and we'll call them qubit zero and qubit one. Okay, puzzle four, we are going to see what an H gate does in this visualization. So we have to use the H gate three times. That's all we have to do here just to see what an H gate does. So I'm going to tell you what it does, and then we're going to do it to see it do it. And then I'm going to tell you what it did again. So here we have a qubit which is certain to output a zero for a Z measurement and going to give a random outcome for an X measurement. When we do a Hadamard, an H gate, it swaps those two things. Um, so that, well, let's do one. Now we are certain to get a zero for an X measurement, but we will get a random result for a Z measurement. So often when people see the Hadamard for the first time, it just looks like a random coin flip, and exactly that's what it looked like when we 
looked at what is quantum. But it's not just a random coin flip. It's uh, actually no more random after we do a Hanamad than before we did a Hanamad. It's just we've switched things around so the randomness is where we're looking now rather than in the corner where we would look if we did an X measurement. Okay, now let's do another couple more. We'll see it flip back and back again. That was a Hanamad. Also now we can start seeing the puzzles, uh, sorry, the circuits that have been created. So here's our qubits, here's our classical register, which we don't actually use. Here are the gates that we've applied. Okay. Now we are going to see something a little bit more complicated, which is some randomness, but not much is going to have changed. Okay, no. Okay, in the next output, we are going to combine the use of the Hanamad and the X gate. So we need to get the Z output fully off. And in this case, we're going to use the H gate um, as many times as we like, but we have to use the X gate exactly three times. Uh, and this is going to require us to know something about how the X gate works, how the X gate affects the output or the X measurement. Now, we're not going to think too much about why the X gate has the same name as the X measurement uh, at the moment, but we'll see in later lectures why that is. At the moment, just think of it as a weird coincidence. So, uh, what we will find is that, well, if we were to do a Hanamad here, we know that applying the X gate flips the value that we would get for the outcome of a Z measurement. But what if the outcome for an X measurement is the one that is certain and the one for a Z measurement is random. If we apply an X in this case, then it flips that random Z measurement outcome from randomly zero or one to be randomly one or zero, which is the same thing. And you'll notice it has no effect on the outcome for the X measurement. So the X gate just did nothing here. So we can do another one of those, so that it also does nothing. And now we've apply the X gate three times, which is one of the conditions, and we can switch those two back, and this one is on. Oh, which is not actually what we wanted to do here. So let's rerun this circuit. We need to have that off. So we can uh, just do all of our three X's here, so they do nothing. And then we can apply that, and we've got the final state that we need. Okay, in the next puzzle, uh, we've seen that the X gate flips the outcome of a Z measurement. If we want to flip the outcome for an X measurement, we need a different gate, which is called the Z gate. Again, a coincidence of names. That's not really a coincidence, but we'll see why later on. If we want to make it so the outcome for an X measurement is certain to be zero rather than certain to be one as it is now, we can apply the Z. In puzzle seven, we're going to combine Z and H. So this is just a fun little exercise. There's not too much being learned here. If we want to uh, flip this certain output of zero for a Z measurement to be a certain output of one, uh, but we have no X to do it, we can just flip that certainty over to the X's. We can use a Z to flip it. We can put the certainty back, and there we go. This is a trick that is actually used in quantum computing a fair amount. Okay, so you might notice that uh, in all cases so far, we've either had the Z output certain to be zero or one and the X output random or vice versa. This is not a coincidence. Uh, this is a consequence of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Whenever we have certainty for the outcome of one type of measurement, we have to have uncertainty for the outcome of the other kind of measurement. Otherwise, this would just be a weird way of having two bits encoded in the same quantum object. It would be a quantum version of two bits, but it's not. It's a quantum version of one bit. We can choose if we want to store that bit where we can see it with the Z measurement, or we can choose whether we want to store that bit where we can see it with the X measurement, but we can't do both. And this uncertainty is what enforces that. Uh, however, we can have a bit more of a compromise. 
And actually, puzzle nine is a better way of, of showing that. If we look at this, we see a compromise where they are both dark gray. So now neither is certain and neither is completely random, but they are both a bit random, but mostly certain to be zero. So it's a bit of a compromise between the two. If we were to apply a Z, then we would find that we have uh, mostly certain to be zero if we make a Z measurement, mostly certain to be one if we make an X measurement, but still both are random. We're not cheating in order to get two bits encoded in here. Both are done with some uncertainty. Um, but the point here is to make them both mostly certain to be one. So there we go. Okay, now we've got the basic tools. We can tackle both qubits at once. So here we have both qubits at once. The point here is to make both Z outcomes random. We can just do that. We have a couple of halomards, one on one side, one on the other side, job done. Okay, now we're gonna start looking at correlations. We're finally at the point where we can start thinking about how correlations are gonna be represented in this visualization. Uh, for this, we need four new circles. So of these new circles, the one at the bottom is doing exactly the same thing as it did before, which is to represent the exclusive or, but this time of the values that we would get for Z measurements of both qubits. And the one at the top represents the exclusive or, if we were to do X measurements of both qubits. So here we see a state where the X measurements are certain in both cases to give us an outcome of zero. Their XOR is therefore zero. And we see that represented by the circle at the top being black. And the other two represent cases where we make a Z measurement of one and an X measurement of the other. And um, we see the exclusive or of those. So if I were to do a Hadamard, for example, on qubit zero. Then we have the case where if we were to do a Z measurement on qubit zero, which is the one on the left, and an X measurement of qubit one, which is the one on the right, then both of those cases would be certain to output a zero. The exclusive or of those two is therefore zero, which is represented by the new circle, which is now black. Now, if you go through the remaining puzzle of level two, this will guide you through some more uh, knowledge and intuition about how this is represented. If you go through the other levels, you will find some more intuition about how other gates uh, have effects in quantum circuits. So I encourage you to go through all of this, but this comes to the end of what I'm actually gonna go through as a lecture right now. So thank you for listening, and I will see you next week.